on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Part of a man-made hill of sulfur being blasted in Texas for shipment to all parts of the world. Hard to realize while looking at such a quantity of almost pure sulfur that this is one of the most critical materials now urgently needed. Despite greatly increased production by our sulfur industry, demand for the element for every conceivable type of manufacture continues to grow. Sulfur is not found lying in huge piles on the ground, of course. So let's go back a bit and see where it did come from. Far below ground in Texas and Louisiana, there are deposits called sulfur domes. Into such a dome, a well is sunk. And down into the well will go several pipes, one inside another. The well is much like an oil well, but bringing out the sulfur is somewhat more complicated than bringing out oil, for it's a solid under no pressure. When the hole is dug, down it through separate pipes will be pumped hot water and hot air from a steam generating station. The water melts the sulfur, the air causes it to froth, and up it comes through a third pipe. From several wells, the liquid sulfur is led through steam-heated pipes to a relay station and on to collection vats, where it's poured out to solidify in the open air. Continuing research by the nation's sulfur producers has uncovered improvements on the fresh process of mining so that previously untappable sources of the precious material are now being made available. Sulfur occurs everywhere in nature in combination with other elements, but the Texas-Louisiana area is one of the few on earth in which it occurs in practically a pure state. A blessing for us since Stalin's industrial machine needs sulfur as desperately as ours, and there are no known deposits of any size behind the Iron Curtain. When a layer has solidified, the sides are raised, and another layer is poured in on top. Thus, it builds up to a height of 50 feet, as we saw earlier. From the subterranean strata where it's rested for millions of years comes sulfur to serve us in many ways. Most of the people of the world have never had freedom or they have surrendered it. So today the world looks to America where we have the strength which only individual freedom can give for help and support. If we are to continue to go forward America, we must all do our part to preserve our basic way of living our sense of individual self-reliance and responsibility. It can only be accomplished if each one of us defends the dignity of man and his personal freedom. It's not one man's job to protect these rights, it's everybody's job. It means we must have more unity and teamwork among all groups in this country. Industry on Parade flies to Wichita, Kansas to visit a steel company located many hundreds of miles from the nearest iron mine, the nearest source of coal. Actually, Watkins Incorporated doesn't manufacture any steel. They fabricate and process it into the hundreds of designs and shapes required by steel users of a four-state area. A chemical company, for example, can't buy a special type of vat it may need simply by thumbing through a catalog. Nor can it build such a vat itself. So, it turns to a steel fabricator like Watkins, right in its own area, and the skilled metal workers of this organization construct exactly the type of vat or beam or furnace required. This calls for considerable versatility on the part of Watkins' men and machines, whose every last product is custom built from the ground up. The firm
firm is fairly small, total staff 145 men, but companies like it are scattered across the nation, providing a vitally needed form of specialization doing the jobs that aren't numerous enough to warrant assembly line production. Here in the making is a cracking tower for an oil refinery. In a few weeks, inside this cylinder, boiling petroleum under high pressure will be giving off its various components, kerosene, chemicals, lubricating oils, and gasoline for our automobiles. In addition to its fabricating division, the firm also maintains a warehouse stocked with 10,000 separate items of industrial equipment as well as the commonly called for shapes and sizes of steel. In an organization this size, company president E.A. Watkins on the left and plant manager Ornsby can maintain personal check on the progress of shipments from both warehouse and fabricating divisions. An essential link in the industrial chain that stretches from the mine to the ultimate consumer. Janssen Knitting Mills in Portland, Oregon, a company that manufactures a long line of sportswear but is best known for the product here being redesigned to keep in step with next year's fashions. Only on a live model can the designer get a true idea of what her handiwork will look like. But going back even further into the creation of a swimsuit, we find balls of fine woolen strands about to be dyed before being made into yarn. The method used in dyeing the balls, known as tops, is to pump the dye solution under pressure into the center of each top so that the dyeing is done from the inside rather than merely by immersion. Now it'll be unwound, washed, rinsed and dried. Then started through a series of operations that open up the fibers, blend them for uniformity, and draw them up to the proper degree of fineness. Only then are they ready to be twisted into yarn. Wool used in swimsuits has to be of a very special type. It has to be fine enough to be soft to the skin, yet coarse enough so the garment will hold its shape despite the stress and strain it will undergo while submerged in water. The yarn is made into cloth on some of the finest knitting machines in the country. The fabric that emerges is laid out in multiple layers on long tables, where the component parts of a number of swimsuits are cut simultaneously. Actually, swimsuits of a particular style and color are not made up in vast quantities like some other garments, say men's shirts. A work order here usually runs to no more than one or two dozen. After the last sewing operation, the swimsuit will be stretched on a wire frame and pressed into its final shape. The diving girl happens to be one of the ten best-known trademarks in the entire world. They're getting prettier every year, the swimsuits that is, and I guess the girls are too. A railroad yard, like hundreds scattered from coast to coast, to handle the switches, the transshipments necessary for moving the products of thousands of factories to millions of consumers everywhere. Some of these cars will head east from here, some west or north or south. The railroads crisscross the nation, reaching into every community. And it's an amazing job they do of getting the shipments to their proper destinations. But here are a couple of Union Pacific officials working to make it an even better job. Working to eliminate damage like this, caused by poor packaging, improper stowing of cargo, or too heavy impact when two freight cars come together. A freight car with one side made of plexiglass is touring the UP's 10,000 miles of line to show yard workers and the road's other employees the effect of switching and other jolts on a boxcar's load. The tour also serves as a test of various ways of securing a load, since the plexiglass side allows observers to see exactly what happens when the car hits another. Now, for a demonstration.
At seven miles an hour, a sudden stop shifts the drums 47 inches. A graphic demonstration to the railroad men that the watchword must be, easy does it. Last year, 50% more physically handicapped employees were placed in jobs than in the year before. A great number of these employees work in and around our nation's largest industrial areas. Properly fitted to the job to be done, thousands of employers have found that these workers make excellent employees, that there is less absenteeism, and often their performance is equal to or better than able-bodied employees. Employers all over the country recognize that to hire the physically handicapped is good business. this for a lumber yard. The striking exterior, like the beautifully paneled interior, which boasts, among other things, the most expensive telephone booth in the world, is in perfect keeping with the sort of wood sold here at J.H. Monteith Lumber Company in the Bronx. Wood like that used in the office of M.H. Dayton, the company's president. Imported woods, rare and beautiful, and in many cases expensive, at least when compared to the more common domestic varieties. Here's a sizable bundle of lumber. How are they going to get it out to the truck waiting in the street? Quite simple, when it's balsa wood, one of the lightest woods on Earth. There are more than 25,000 species of wood known to man, and while no company can keep all of them in stock, this one does its best to fill any orders. At the other extreme from Balsa is lignum vitae, wood of life, once worth its weight in gold. And its weight is considerable, like its hardness that'll turn a ten-penny nail. Brazilian rosewood, ebony, teak, Japanese oak, just a few of the exotic woods handled by these experts every day. Some orders they fill run to many thousands of board feet. Others, like those of amateur and professional wood carvers, are very small, but at the same time very special. The grain should follow the contours of the projected sculpture. One of the perils of this business lies in the fact that some woods, like zebra wood from Africa, smell so terrible it takes a mill hand with a strong stomach to stay around when it's being sawed. Much of the imported lumber is peeled into veneer at the firm's mills in New Jersey and Virginia for use in fine furniture, paneling, boats, airplanes, and other quality products. This is fine mahogany, of which Monteith processes several thousand tons a year. These are men in a business with a lot of history behind it, and with the search for new woods, for new tasks being pressed constantly, they expect there's a lot of history yet to be written. on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. It's 85 below zero in Houston, Texas, at least inside this Arctic test room where diesel-powered generators for use by the armed forces are test run at temperatures as much as 120 degrees below freezing. In other tests, the generators will be operated in a room where the mercury registers a constant 135 above. All routine for Stewart and Stevenson Services Incorporated, a company known as a distributor of engines but whose actual functions go far beyond mere distribution. Diesel and gasoline engines arrive from the manufacturer in this state. They're power plants that can serve no useful purpose until ways have been devised and equipment built
to transform their power into useful work, whether it's in a mill, on the farm, in oil fields, lumber yards, or any other branch of industry. That's the job of Stewart and Stevenson, making it possible to put the engines to work. This generator unit for use in the Arctic, for example, must be equipped with a heater that'll keep it running no matter how cold the weather may be. Burners for the heaters are assembled, as are the complex wiring systems for the electrical controls. The prefabricated harnesses of wire are so prepared that they can be quickly and easily installed in the control panels. From fuel tank to radiator housing, all the components that go around an engine and allow it to do its particular job are designed, fabricated, and assembled right here. Finally, the sub-assemblies come together to form a compact, easily transported unit. The generator is set in place, and then the engine itself. With the international situation calling our forces to more and more remote parts of the world, from the hot, corroding tropics to the bitter, cold polar regions, only the know-how of firms like Stewart and Stevenson permits our men to take along the machines we use so effectively here at home. The miniature electric power stations are first test run under normal conditions, while exhaustive studies and necessary adjustments are made, and records started on every unit. But the showdown comes in the Arctic test room, where, to meet the terms of the government contract, the generators must be started in less than an hour, after a day and a half at temperatures that transform oils into solids. Obviously, the men who work in the Arctic chamber must dress like Eskimos. And even with all this extra clothing, they can't stay in the room more than 15 minutes, or their eyelids will freeze open. They're also careful not to breathe deeply while inside for fear of damaging their lungs. The unit is wired to 36 meters in the control room to register temperatures at various points in the machine. By these exhaustive methods, does Stewart and Stevenson utilize engine power for every imaginable purpose in traveling cranes. In donkey engines. Sawmills. Wherever you turn in industry these days, you'll find small, dependable, inexpensively operated engines toiling around the clock. And whether it's cutting wood or providing emergency power in a hospital, the engine in most cases required special engineering to fit it to the job. In agriculture, special pumps and fittings permit the engine to irrigate parched farmland, vastly increasing our output of food. One more demonstration of the benefits that come from a number of specialized organizations pulling together, each performing its unique function as a vital member of the nation's industrial team. Today's frontiersman does not wear a coonskin cap or shoulder a hunting rifle. More likely, he's wearing a laboratory apron with a stirring rod. Today's pioneer, the scientist, finds new lands to explore in test tubes. His hunting is done with a microscope. The scientist, an engineer working with the businessman, tamed the wilderness with steamboats and railroads, provided harvesters to cut the prairie grain and feed a growing nation. Scientists harnessed the power of rivers, coal, and oil help give Americans high-quality, mass-produced goods. Yes, today, America's new frontiers are in science. The skilled hands of a craftsman sharpening a tool. They're old and well-lined, these hands. For 71 years, they've been busy at the woodcarver's trade but you'd have to search long and hard to find a younger man with the sure touch of Uncle Joe Unglaub of Louisville. Here at the Louisville Chair Company, where Uncle Joe is repair foreman, they make sleek, modern furniture with none of the elaborate carving he handles so artfully. 
But when one of the older pieces comes in for repairs or the replacement of a broken part, Uncle Joe is the man they turn to. Joe claims he's only 90, but his fellow employees say he's been claiming that for three years, ever since he retired for two weeks, and then came back to work because he didn't know what to do with himself. 35 years of work on his own time have made Joe's home perhaps the most painstakingly decorated house in Kentucky, if not the whole country. There are seven mantles in the place, like the other woodwork and furniture, all hand-carved, all solid mahogany. Joe Unglaub, portrait of a man who has found lasting satisfaction in his work. At the International Amphitheater in Chicago, 25,000 of the nation's industrial production experts inspect $18 million worth of fabulous machines on display at the exposition of the American Society of Tool Engineers. Special effects help dramatize new developments in the field of machine tool engineering. But some of the amazing devices to be seen here are dramatic enough in their own right. Take the Contour Projector Model 3, shown by Eastman Kodak, a device for gauging by sight the dimensions of tiny parts that formerly could be checked for accuracy only through a long series of mechanical measurements. To learn what such a machine can mean to industry, we visit one of the thousands of plants across the country in which shapeless metals are converted into a myriad of intricate production parts. From the punch presses, forges, casting molds, grinders, and other metal forming machines, they pour out by the millions. And the quantity isn't nearly as surprising as the fact that these parts must be interchangeable, one just like another, with the permissible variations measured in thousands of an inch. This rotor goes through 27 separate gaugings to make sure it conforms to specifications. Correct diameter inside and out, all indentations of the right size and properly spaced. In 27 ways, they make sure it's everything it should be. The precision checks take as much time as the manufacturing. To simplify the procedure, Eastman Kodak engineers developed after years of research a method of magnifying the part accurately to 20, 30, up to 100 times its actual size. At the same time, a firm called Engineer Specialties devised means of preparing a drawing of the part to the same scale and inscribing it on special glass, onto which the magnified image could then be projected. Result? the art of optical gauging by means of the contour projector. In effect, they have made it possible to take the finished part and project it back to the drawing board for comparison with the original blueprints. At a glance, we can see that this part is undersized. Light shows through beneath the limit lines. Projecting a profile on the glass is one thing, but how do you check the shape of a concave surface? The contour projector has a fixture for that, too. One that'll even gauge the contours of this deep recess. It's done by causing a pin to ride in the groove, then projecting the shadow of a rectal attached to that pin onto the glass, where two scribed circles mark the limits beyond which the part is not allowed to deviate. To study first one dimension of the part, then another smaller dimension, you turn the knob. After a while, you can see the very dust along the edges of the metal. As the demand grows for ever closer tolerances, ever greater speed and precision, the contour projector is a tool that will help America increase production to arm for defense and maintain the unprecedented rate of increase in our standard of living. Since Americans enjoy the highest standard of living in the world, we must make sure that any changes in our system are going to increase this standard rather than decrease it, and that whatever happens to our system will benefit us in the three roles most of us play. First, as producers. In working for a living, each of us helps to produce a product or a service. Second, as customers. We all buy products and services produced by others. And third, as savers. Most of us put something aside in bank accounts, insurance policies, stocks, or bonds. Remember, better living standards depend on all of us.
Meet Buckaroo Bill and Sagebrush Sal, two of the lifelike marionettes created and here being made to perform by Mrs. Hazel Rollins of Kansas City, who's as expert at puppeteering as she is at managing the thriving company that turns out 50,000 of the little acting dolls each year. Heads and arms for Hazel's marionettes are molded from a mixture of wood flour and chemicals. After drying for about a month, they'll be given 15 coats of lacquer before the faces are painted on by hand. There are 42 characters in the company's line. Four are replaced each year by new models designed by Mrs. Rollins. Cheek coloring is applied by airbrush, and such items as pointed hats for Tito and Bimbo the Clowns are painted by dipping. Meanwhile, the other parts of the marionette are being prepared elsewhere in the plant. Plastic shoes have been molded and here are joined to the legs. Arms and legs are attached to the trunk. Costumes, all originated to the last button by Madam President, are put together by skilled operators. The marionettes are dressed. A glue shampoo prepares this character for a head of theatrical crepe hair. The seven strings by which the marionettes are worked are the last to go on. These strings will be attached to a patented airplane control developed by Mrs. Rollins for easier, more lifelike animation. She demonstrates how it works with the cooperation of Mr. Rollins, who now helps her run the business she founded 18 years ago. The business of bringing new pleasure into the lives of children. on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. At the Wyman Gordon Company plant at North Grafton, Massachusetts, Die blocks are heated before going into the biggest forge press in the Western Hemisphere. This fire-breathing, five-million-pound monster exerts a pressure of 18,000 tons, allowing aircraft parts that had been painstakingly fastened together bit by bit to be stamped out of a single piece of aluminum with tremendous savings for the taxpayer. Both the dies and the metal to be shaped are preheated to temperatures beyond 800 degrees Fahrenheit. The flames that result come from oil used for lubrication. The use of giant presses to produce large, complex parts, which formerly no one would have dreamed of trying to stamp out, means faster, less expensive production of the aircraft so urgently needed today. The press is owned by the Air Force, which is using Wyman Gordon as a pilot plant for testing a heavy press program that will result in erection of nine such presses here and at other companies across the nation. Believe it or not, this huge press is small when compared with two others about to be installed here. One of the new ones will exert 35,000 tons of pressure. The other, an astounding 50,000 tons. A tiny working model of the 50,000 tonner itself has a force of four and a half tons. Merely installing machines like this is a major engineering project. 
Here at the site where they'll be assembled, preparations include the sinking of a hole 10 stories deep, into which thousands of tons of reinforced concrete will go to assure a firm foundation for the extraordinary weight of the presses. Heavy presses, possible key to the true mass production of aircraft. Productivity is one of the keystones of American progress. What does it mean to you? Productivity is the end result of men in good health working with modern machinery in good repair, operated by management with good will. Men, machines, and management are employed by the savings of people invested in a machine shop, store, farm, or factory. Productivity is greatest when management is able, and both employees and investors are well paid for their investments of time and savings. Increased productivity helps reduce costs and prices, increase wages and salaries, and enables all of us to enjoy higher living standards. Into the waters of the Androscoggin River in northern New England go hundreds of four-foot pulpwood logs to be floated downstream to mills of the Brown Paper Company of Berlin, New Hampshire, for conversion into a few of the many kinds of paper for which man has found uses. A long conveyor removes the logs from the water and dumps them on one of several huge piles. From here, the logs go to drums for removal of the bark. Only fibers of the solid wood are suitable for paper making. Chipped into tiny pieces, the wood goes into digester tanks for cooking, which, together with the action of acids, breaks the wood down into pulp. Next step is the removal of most of the liquor, as it's called, and then the thickening of the pulp in an agitating machine that also helps produce thorough distribution of the wood fibers. The type of paper being made here is that used in paper towels. So that means maximum absorption and great strength are the twin goals. The fairly thick mat heads for one of the firm's seven paper machines, where in less than a minute, it'll be converted into paper toweling. Emerging, the paper is wound in huge rolls. Before it can start through the next process, the cutting and folding of the finished towels, the paper must be reduced to towel width. This is done by sharp disc-like knives mounted at the entrance to the towel converter. And here they come, in a continuous stream, ready for wrapping by deft hands and shipment to all parts of the world. In industries and institutions, now even in homes, the convenience, low cost, and disposability of paper towels have developed a demand that requires billions of them every year. A convenience generally taken for granted that would not have been possible without production miracles that made paper good enough to do the job and cheap enough to throw away afterward. The Tuna Clipper May Queen docks at Terminal Island, California with a cargo of tuna that almost have reason to be happy they were caught. For these fish are about to be processed in the spanking new star-kissed cannery, and what a cannery it is. From the moment the tuna come out of refrigerated holes, they're moved from point to point automatically, carried along either by water or conveyor belt. After thawing, they're eviscerated by experts. Men reporting to the state health department have the very specialized and very demanding job of checking for objectionable odors. Then cooked in large steam ovens, the fish arrive in this vast room, where 500 skilled workers separate the clear white meat from red meat, bones, and skin. The waste material will be converted into fish meal and oil. Only about a third of the original fish will wind up in a can, some as solid pack, some as chunks. Smaller segments are diced into chunks. 
Meanwhile, the cans into which the tuna will go have been sterilized and after automatic filling are given a mechanically measured pinch of salt. Then vegetable oil is added the same way with just the right amount poured into each can. There are inspectors every few feet. This one records weights and the amount of salt and oil added. The most spectacular sight in a cannery is the cans themselves and the way they're scooted about. Just before sealing, a jet of steam is shot into the can so that once the top is on, a vacuum will form inside, ensuring that the product will keep for long periods. The cans move on to be washed in a detergent that removes all trace of oil or other matter from the outside. Then down into retort baskets for the trip to the pressure cookers. Fifty-five minutes at 250 degrees. The temperature inside the retort is continuously and automatically recorded. After the heat treatment, the cans and their contents are cooled while still in the retort as cold water is sprayed over them. Now the cans start another dizzy rush through a series of machines. First, the unscrambler that sets them on end and sends them on their way to the labeler. 86,000 tins an hour, a remarkable new addition to the facilities of the nation's food processing industry. People do not have to be conquered by an army to lose their freedom. It can slip away painlessly through mistrust and hate and the surrender of some of their so-called lesser rights. We must not let that happen to America. We must fight for freedom in our daily lives by taking the time and trouble to vote wisely, by protecting our own rights and the rights of others, and by showing our faith in America in everything we think, say, and do. Let's do our share to guard the freedom we know and enjoy and protect it for those young Americans who will inherit tomorrow the results of what we do today. Rodeo, a sport that's getting more popular every year. Strictly as a spectator sport, however, the majority of people taking up the horses do so firmly planted in the saddle at all times. And saddles, fine saddles, are the product of this company, visited by Industry on Parade. Here at Hamley and Company in Pendleton, Oregon, 50 devoted souls give loving attention to the making of saddles and other equipment for sons and daughters of the Old West. Basic part of a saddle, like the chassis of an automobile, is the saddle tree. It's made of wood, usually five pieces of wood and a steel horn. First thing, the tree must be covered with wet rawhide, untanned leather that shrinks as it dries, covering the wood snug and tight. Using the tree and customer specifications as his guides, the cutter blocks out the leather parts that will go on next. These are many and varied and have names like cantle board, gullet cover, fork, and skirt. But each has a definite function and must balance with the corresponding part on the opposite side if there's to be comfort for horse and rider. To ensure proper balance, the saddle maker, the master craftsman who takes over next, skivs the cut leather, paring it to the proper thickness. Saddle maker Leonard Nichols has been with Hamley since 1902. But among a great many other things, he's learned that he's making a saddle not for himself or anyone who just happens to buy it, but for a specific individual who usually has definite ideas about what he wants. Onto the rawhide covered saddle tree, first are placed the cut parts, the ground seat, and over that the seat itself which is fitted three times before finally being set in position. Hour after hour, the saddle maker trims and fits, trims and fits. Seven cord linen thread is used in all bindings for tightness and permanence. The different saddle styles are almost as numerous as women's clothes, but last a lot longer. When all the parts are ready, 
They're strung together by another expert using thongs of selected lace leather. The saddle strings dangling from both sides have often been mistaken for mere decoration, but as we see, they are an integral part of the saddle. But while the strings have nothing to do with appearance, something else about the saddle does, and that's the elaborate hand tooling demanded by so many saddle buyers. The instrument used as a hammer is called a stamping stick, and as for the tool that makes the impression, as many as 20 or more of them may be used in putting the design on one saddle. Hand tooling is the final touch with all the careful labor that goes into it. Labor they wouldn't waste on an inferior saddle is the conclusive evidence that here is a saddle a man can place with pride on the back of a horse he loves.